International Men's Day and International Toilet Day falling on the same day? Is this a coincidence? Well, it's definitely no coincidence that at that exact point where those two bisect each other is right here on The Mythwits. The show dedicated to all things geek and pop culture, drenched in absurdity, and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring you an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding Gigaverse and to play a game with us. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Mike Kafis, and I'm joined this week by my co-host and author, Peter Bryant. And our guest this week... Yes. Yeah, how you doing? And our guest this week... (laughs) It's Justin Andrew Mason. Justin is a professional game designer, any award-winning author, graphic designer, and map master, award-winning cartographer. He is currently the owner of Paths to Adventure, and he was heavily involved with avoiding my Q&A session at AetherCon 7, the online RPG convention. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome, Justin. Good evening. Yes, that was you, wasn't it? <laughs> that was me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> nice. I thought I'd give you a little zinger there. Nice. Yeah, there was. We, I had to run and go fix some things real quick. So, sorry about that. Hey, no problem. I got off an hour early. I was good. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's like, oh, he's not going to show up. Oh, darn. Oh, uh, so, darn hey, heck. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, I just wanted to say, because usually during the interview or during the, the introductions, you get one, like a second or two to say something. I want to say that, you know, back to the International Day and uh, International Men's Day and toilets, I am proud to be a man. Uh, we're not all bad. Some of us are really good, good people. Uh, but I do like toilets. Toilets are one of my favorite places to spend uh, some quality time. So International Toilet Day, I will share that holiday with, with other men. I th- and I think right. a lot of men would, 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 would agree with that. Yes. And let, let me, I did a little bit of reading about International Toilet Day. And uh, it's actually a very serious uh, campaign. So that for, for the year, uh, I believe it's tw- uh, nine, uh, no, 2030? that there's a campaign to have a toilet in every household in the world. That's important. That's actually really important. It is. So, it is. yeah. And, and, and you know what? You know who's going to do it? Who? Men. Well, maybe. I don't know. I think women will be involved too. But you know what? <laughs> I, I, would, I would imagine. So, uh, yeah, you know, one of the greatest inventions, you know, there, there's always this big debate about what the greatest invention of mankind was. You know, some people say it was fire. Some people say electricity, right? But there is a case to be made for sanitation because uh, it has saved so many lives. It's so important, proper sanitation to a mm-hmm. society, especially once it gets bigger than, uh, you know, a certain amount. I don't know what that number is, but if there's a certain number that once it gets bigger than that, if you don't take care of proper sanitation, you get outbreaks of cholera and plague and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. And your society goes down the crapper, yeah. which is ironic. <laughs> ironic. That, yeah. Right. <laughs> but um, tis. Yes. But we're All not right. talking about that tonight, Mike, are we? Uh, n- well, not anymore. Right. Hopefully. I hope not. I want to talk about maps because, I don't know, Pete was telling me that that's like the second biggest invention in uh, history. Because without it, you know, um, I don't think uh, Columbus would have found America. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> that wasn't so good for about 10, what, 10 yeah. million people. <laughs> it wasn't the greatest thing. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's there's a breach in your linear thought there somewhere. Well, uh, well, let's, say... let's discuss. <laughs> let's discuss. <laughs> yes. No, yes. Yeah, so so uh, Justin and I have, have worked on uh, AetherCon together quite a bit. Uh, and that's where I, I found out about all of Jason's stuff. And he does some really fantastic maps. If you're looking over, wait a minute, let me do the thing. If you're looking over here, uh, you will see a bunch of his maps appear. Justin, I, I, I bought into your big book of maps, the first one. Uh, and I have several of those maps on my computer at the moment. Uh, I pulled a few of them and like shrunk them down to fit in the little window so people could see examples of your work. So if you're seeing the, the, the maps appear in this window, those are all Justin's maps and they are awesome. So, uh, thank you, man. So, so you, God, I can't believe when you say big book of maps, I mean, like it's a big freaking book of maps. Like how many maps was in that? Do, do you even know how many maps were in that? Yeah. Yeah. I think there was a little over 230 maps in that book. Right. And these are full on, like full on dungeon maps. 
yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. At least a, in fact, that when I build them, they're actually built to be poster resolution size, so you could like blow them up to a giant poster. Yeah, like I'm looking at what. So there's one on the screen right now while we're talking, and it it looks like it's uh, it's like a it's got greenery and stuff around in between the rooms and a whole bunch of rooms. Now it's a single level. All these are single level, right? I mean, you can put them. I guess there's some of them that you can put together. Um, you know, and and they come. There's a player version that you have in there, and then a GM's version. So the one that you're seeing now, it just changed. But the one you were just seeing uh, didn't have numbers on it. And that would be something that you could lay out on the table that the players could see. And then like the one that you're seeing now is an example of one with the numbers on it. So that's the one that the GM would see, right? Um, now, I noticed numbers and stuff on there, but that would be something the game master would make up themselves, right? Or or does the book, did the like printed book have designations on what those rooms were or did you just number no, the rooms no, or? It's, it's, they're just numbered for convenience for the G, for gms the, there was no adventure content written for any of those simply because i think you know writing or fitting in 230 adventures with 230 maps would make a a, a book that's you know not not feasible right. and it would have taken much longer to, to to create right and and this this leaves it open for you know for open games so if i'm if i'm a game master and I, you know and i'm i'm running adventures and stuff uh, you know, I might say, oh, okay, uh, yeah, I wanted to go to this island, and uh, just looking at the one I'm looking at now, um, and it's like, oh, yeah, I can use this map. You know, they, they, they're they going to pull up on the beach, and there's this big building right in front of them, uh, and then I, I, would, I would have that to go to, and then I could put whatever I want in there. Let's say there's a villain, that, that uh, reoccurring villain that they've been encountering, or... I want to use I don't know I want to use some kind of like uh, like uh, some natives to the area, uh, some primitive era or primitive style natives, uh, but I could also use if I wanted to then I could also use something like what are the, what are those um, creatures in D and D the the Krakatoa Krakatoa no crap I can, I'm not saying it wrong they're like kind of like they're kind of like fishy type men you know there was the 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 mm. they had that that uh underwater adventure where they had the oh crap i'm blowing it i can't yeah. think of it the the that... isle of of something katoans or something anyway but you could use like fish people if you want to or lizard men or whatever but it would be up to you and you could do it any way you wanted to that way bust out some bully wugs bully wugs okay that would work yeah 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 um or slads right or more slads like lizard like people yeah yeah okay shawajin Maybe that's what it is. Salgin, Salagin, S A H U A G I N. That might be it. But anyway, the, that doesn't matter. Fish like <laughs> monstrous. The the point is is that you can customize these maps to run any type of adventure you want to run. Um, so well, see, and thing, the thing is, when it comes to, to tabletop gaming, I think uh, especially RPGs, you've got a, you know, you got two kind of two kind of GMs. You've got one who likes to have your material prepped. You know, so they'll go buy an adventure module, and you get those who like to create their own. But one thing that all GMs share and have in common is a lack of time. So being able to go grab a map that's numbered, created, ready to run, has a player version, and slap your own content into that is, is kind of convenient. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of game masters like to make their own maps. That's fun. It's fun making your maps. But most people lack this, like that high level of skill. You know, so like, yeah, they, they can draw it on graph paper, right? But it looks like a, a person drew it on a graph paper, which, and there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Yep. But it's also really cool to lay down this beautiful map and, and it just, it sparks that imagination in people, you know, because that, I mean, that's a big part of why role-playing games, why the art is so important because it just, it just, it literally lights up your imagination and you can see yourself in the scene better. Um, so, so let me ask you, how long does it take to do one of these? Like, like. I, I know, and I, I know they're all different. The more complex they are, the longer they take. But just, just on average, roughly, what, what would it take to do one of these? Well, in the style that the Big Book of Maps has, probably uh, on range between three and five hours. And there was two hundred, two hundred thirty, and a few and change. So let me let me carry the. Right, while <laughs> you're doing your math, what program or programs do you use in your just, pipeline for this? Just Photoshop. That's it. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and and so so that's about a thousand hours. <clears throat> so that's quite a bit of time. It was so, a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So Justin and I have talked about this. We talked about this on another on, a, on one of the Aethercon podcasts. But I'm gonna go over a bunch of this stuff. So Jason, if it's if it's a repeat to you, me asking you, our audience hasn't seen it probably. Um, 
so yeah, we were talking about how he does how how you do this in Photoshop, and I do some map work myself, and and we Jason and I turns out or Justin, God damn, it, why do I always say Jason? I, I do this to you every me, and it rhymes I, with Jason. I know this every time. <laughs> Everybody Justin. does it. So Justin, um, <laughs> we use we use very similar processes, right? So so tell me, like, all right, let's go through some of these processes. So when you put the walls in, because this this will delineate out some of these processes, which make us look so good. Uh, what are some of the things you do to the walls to make them differentiate, say, between the floors and stuff? Well, a lot of, I'll use a lot of drop shadow uh, effects, and I'll skew those slightly to make it appear like there's light coming from one direction. And you can kind of drop that behind your, your wall uh, layer on your on your document, and that'll give it an effect across the board that you have light shining from a specific direction. Right. And then do you use um, – so I'm like one of the things that I do, I like to take – I'll take like uh, – my maps will actually just be shapes, you know. I start out with shapes, so I'll draw my shapes up, and then I start laying pat, like you know, laying patterns down. So I'll have the floors as one shape, and the walls as another shape, and then I'll do a pattern overlay on it. Do you do the same thing? Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty much exactly. Ironically, we were talking about graph paper and maps. Uh, I've got a video over on my blog, buried somewhere, that shows the process of creating one of these uh, for the big book of maps. And uh, basically, what I start off with is a grid, and and the selection tool, and it looks like I'm drawing a map on graph paper. And you know, then I go from there, create my shapes, my layers, and then dump different textures, add different effects, and then go in and touch up by hand. Right, right. And then like, so like lighting. So like when you put torches on the walls, right? Um, one of the things I did, I don't, I think you did this a little differently than I did. So, and, and there's different ways to do it. Like, so, so everybody has their own process and Photoshop has so many tools that there's just like, there's no one way to do anything. One of the things I like to do, I like to have a shape, like actually have a shape for the light. So like, I'll have like a torch, like a torch will be like this big around. And then I have a circle, basically just a, a solid circle that goes over top of that. And then I make that circle, you know, uh, 20% transparent, you know, so, so you're only seeing 20% of it. And then I'll throw like a gradient, so like a gradient fill on it. And then I'll make it the color of the light, whatever, yellow or whatever. And that gives me a really good torch effect. But that's not the only way to do it. Like you do, you could do like um, like glow effect, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Glow effect would work. But you don't have as much flexibility uh, when, you, when you're using your styles that way. But what you can do is similar to what you did is I just create a, like a, a, for a torch. I'll put my torch object out there that I've already created. I've already drawn it. And I'll just do put an orange circle in the layer beneath it and then just uh, Gaussian blur it. Oh, uh, right. And it spreads, it dissipates the light out. Hmm, you know, right. So it's brighter towards the middle and lighter as it moves out away from the light source. Yeah, that would be a good way to do it too. Yeah. One of the things that I did was I had stairs going down on one of my maps. And I took, I actually took like a rectangle and and it started at the bottom of the stairs, the width of the stairs, and it went all the way up to the top of the stairs. And then I did a, I did a gradient fill on that. Right, so that it went from, but it actually went from black to transparent. So that was how the gradient worked, and it looked really cool. It looked like the stairs went down into the darkness. Absolutely, and then you can also do fun, you know, three-dimensional effects, you know, on a 2D map by like if you have two intersecting tunnels, you know, if you add a little gradient uh, black on each side of that, it actually appears as if it goes under it. You yeah. know, so you can you can play around with your sort of multi-level that way. Okay. All right. Uh, but but let's take this back to let's take this back to the big book of maps, right? So when you buy the big book of maps, Jason, or just, God damn it, Justin, you you Drink. include, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you include like the like the objects, right? Was, was that the package that included the objects as well? Yeah, well, the Kickstarter did. The Kickstarter uh, backers got everything. They got access to the book. They got the PDF of the book, and they got all 230 maps and high super high resolution. VTT format, all three versions, and they also got all the icons individually. Now, okay. if you're going to purchase it, the book itself, the PDF, does not come with that. You have to purchase okay. the icon set and the maps individually. Right, right. And if, and here's the important thing, right? If you're making maps and you purchase the icon set, now does this come uh, standard or was this a specialized? I can't remember. I, I can't remember what I paid for. Um, you can use the icons for your own works as well. Does that come with the icons? It just uh, initially or do you have to pay extra for that yeah actually there was a license for that there okay. is and it's it's you could technically have to contact me if you want to get one uh because i haven't made that publicly available it was only available to backers through a specific pledge level right. uh, but i've actually had people contact me after the kickstarter uh to get those licenses that i offered during the kickstarter and i've got no problem doing that okay yeah so what that means for any of you 
anyone who doesn't un understand what I'm talking about, what we're talking about here, let's say you want to make your own maps and you want to use the icons that Justin has made because they're great, right? Um, and, and believe me, you're going to want icons because if you have to create them all by scratch, you're going to spend a very long time creating all this stuff by scratch. Um, and you want to say, say, like, for example, in my case, I'm not selling maps. I make, I used these as tools for my uh, uh, Cuba Death Kickstarter, which is coming up in the future. So my cards, I have a set of cards that have, have little maps on them, the little one-room maps, and it's basically an encounter. Um, so by being able to use those icons, I can make my own maps using a lot of the resources that, that Justin has supplied. Um, and I don't have to, I, you know, I can do that without having to pay him anything for royalties because I've paid for the right to use them in my own works. Now, I can't turn around and sell those icons to anyone else. That's It's like an end user license, right? So I can't yeah. give those away. I can't sell them to anyone else. But I could make a map with them and then sell those maps. So it's really, really cool. I love that. That's, that's an awesome... It is an awesome option to have. And it was really, honestly, that was the selling point. That that was the, I was like, oh, I really want this. And then once you said that, I was like, oh, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> well, I have to thank the folks over, you know, the crowd over at the Cartographers Guild because yes. that wasn't even an option. They uh, they chimed in and said, hey, we would love to have the option to buy these, you know. So I actually added that late into the first Kickstarter uh, to, to get that license. So it, that's, uh, thanks to them. And it did, man. It, it, there was a lot of people who bought into it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, and uh, you're do Pete, well, yeah. may I may so, I just interject for just one second and say I think we have a Mythwits first. Uh yeah. Tim Cask has just uh, entered our chat room. Just to, oh, nice. I mean, he, he may not be here now. He may have said, Oh, it's these guys and left. But uh, <laughs> now, Tim's I, a buddy of ours. Hey Tim, uh, welcome, Tim's welcome awesome. to watch the show. Tim. That's right. We love That's Tim. Right. Yeah, so um so and you've got so I know a lot of people have seen the fantasy maps and stuff, but you have a futures map coming up. Right. Yeah, actually, the second volume of the book, I ran the Kickstarter back, I think it was in February, uh, and it's scheduled to be released in, uh, I think, April, uh, but we'll probably, last book, we I released months early ahead of schedule, and I'll do the same with this book, but uh, it contains entirely science fiction maps, which right. is, is kind of a fun shift from the, the typical fantasy maps I'm usually creating. And there you go, there you go, Paul Noons, he was just saying, I need maps for Mara Project and Aftermath and Twilight 2000, so, boom! There you go. That's perfect. Yeah. Boom. So, so, so where do you, uh, uh, Justin, so where do you go from here? So you, you've got, you know, there's fantasy maps and then there's, you know, and then there's futuristic maps and then there would be stuff in between. You, are you going to do any, like, I guess you would call them modern or, or near modern or, or maybe even like, like the uh, pulpish, like, like I, I have a problem with that. So like sometimes when I'm developing uh, RPG stuff, I have a hard time because modern means like today or like, you know, a couple years ago or a couple years from now, but like, I always feel like, oh crap! Well, so is Western? Is it is it its own category? Is it still kind of fall into the early age of modern? And where does pulp fall in there? Like, like are you gonna do any of those? Well, uh, sort of. Let's see. I've got volume one and it's out. Uh, volume two is what I'm currently working on. Well, as a stretch goal during the Kickstarter for volume two, backers actually reached that stretch goal and unlocked volume three. So I'm simultaneously working on volume three, oh uh, which is uh, mini dungeon maps. They're like half page maps, but they're all fantasy. Both of those books will be released about the same time. Uh, I've got. Uh, I'm planning on having a volume four uh, that I'll kickstart next year, uh, and that's going to be uh, fantasy two, but it's going to be focused on themes, and it's sort of related back to your t comment about not having multi levels for the maps. Mm -hmm. uh, the the fantasy themes book, which is will be volume four, is actually going to focus on having uh, multiple maps of the same style that could easily be stacked for multi-layer dungeons, multi-level dungeons. Uh, and that's what the whole, the whole book will be, be focused around. Uh, and after that, I've got a few other ideas, but that's way ahead. You're talking about 2021, 20, 2022, but I think when it comes to like your, your niche genres, I think what I've been pondering doing uh, is actually starting up a series uh, of smaller books that are all focused on, on a specific theme. And then make it like a, a collection of, of those series where you have like a western, you have a you know nineteen you know forties mid century, you have modern you know near future and those you know whatever whatever else I could come up with, but right. it's kind of hard to jumble all those together into one book, right. and then have a, have an audience that's interested in it. So I think smaller books would be the goal for those. And and you know I would think that that you know to to do something on the side like well, why don't you just do like a small book of western, I don't think. Some people might not realize that that it's not just that easy because 
like we were saying before about the icons and building your your library of stuff to build these maps, right? That in itself is its own like that's like its own task. All you know, that could take you a month or two months to build. I got to build all my icons. I got to get all my my textures. I got you know figure out what my my shapes are going to be for my 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 uh, maps, and then 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 when you build them, it's like you're it's it's sort of like a graphic Legos type of thing. I want to put this here and put that there and put doors here and blah Legos blah blah. Legos is very very accurate. That that is very much what it's like. Yeah. Like like the building of the maps seems like it's the other half. Like half of it is prepping to build any maps at all, and then the other half is building all of the maps, right? Yes. <laughs> the, the the bigger half is building the maps, but yeah, it right. takes an, an incredible amount of, of time investment up front uh, just to get going. So Paul was saying that he wants post-apocalyptic and uh, Mad Max, and I had to make a joke. I was like, geez, Paul, what do you want, a map of the desert? Yeah. Like, it's, it's just it's sand. Sand, right. <laughs> and a road. Exactly. <laughs> well, and, so, and that's another thing, too. A lot, I, uh, I release all these maps individually through drive through RPG for like two bucks each, and that's mm-hmm. you get all the, the super high-resolution ones for, for that. But a lot of these maps are can be cross genre. Like a lot of the science fiction maps, you know, would work just fine for a modern modern map. You know, so going out and being able to go grab those individual maps is handy. But you know, a lot of times your genre specific stuff really isn't as genre specific as you might think it would be. Right. Yeah. I mean, like you could take half of the futures maps and use them for like a superheroes campaign. It's just, it's a it's a villain exactly. base, you know, because a supervillain's going to have like a crazy super base, right? So you could use it for that or cyberpunk. I mean, cyberpunk, really, honestly, sci-fi, cyberpunk, it's kind of when you're looking at a map, it's, yeah, yeah. it's pretty Well, nice. I mean, it, you know, fantasy desert ruins is not going to be a lot different than a ruined city, you know, in a post-apocalyptic campaign. That's correct. Yeah. What about maps of steam tunnels in a steampunk adventure? Uh, sewers in the fantasy book. I have several of those in there already. Boom. Boom. There you go. There you go, Spence. <laughs> <laughs> Although nice. I will, I, I will admit, I, I would like to do a, a, a series of steampunk, a steampunk maps because you can just get all kinds of uh, outla- outlandish uh, icons and things to be built with that. I can, I can just the mad science slabs and the the dirigibles and everything. It could be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. So when you build your icons, so when when you're building your icon, are, are they? Um... Because there's, there's different ways you could do this as well, and you and I talked about this before. Like, you build yours straight up in Photoshop, right? Like, you draw yeah. them and color them in and everything? Yeah, and that's mainly because I want to keep sort of a consistent look with the maps that they're being released with. You know, because, that you know, I don't, you know, like, create any 3D objects or anything for the maps. And if I created 3D objects for the icons, they would kind of be kind of mismatched just a bit. Right, right. Yeah, because uh, there are some people, so from the Cartographers Guild, which I got into because I was making maps and stuff, and you can find, they actually have uh, quite a few resources there, and many of them are, um, are royalty-free. Like, they, they don't care. Yeah, you can use it for whatever you want to use it for. Don't care. You can sell them, not sell the icon itself, but sell something you've made with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of that, a lot of them come from people, because I recognize, because, you know, I worked in Poser for so long doing, like, 3D art and stuff. That a lot of these are just 3D objects from, say, Poser or Daz Studio or one of these, you know, any one of these 3D programs, um, as as props, and they've just rendered it from the top down. Uh, and then if you want to make them consistent, you could throw like a cartoon render on them, or like, or do like a shade shade style render on them yeah. um, to get them out in in like a, a 2D map format if you wanted to. But I, I think that if you're if you're doing your own maps and you wanted to to build some of your own icons. Dude, Daz Studio is free. There's a, a tons of free pop props that you can get. Uh, again, watch your rights because if you're going to sell the map, make sure they're royalty free. You can't just download other people's stuff, stick it on your map, and sell it. I mean, you can, but you shouldn't. You know what I mean? You get to, it's to, a non creative commons. The mail. Yeah. What's that? It's a non creative <laughs> commons. Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, so that's, I mean, you know, that that's pretty cool. So what do you, like, for for maps outside of buildings, so like like carto- like like actual cartography type stuff, like, I don't know, is, is inside a building cartography or is it, or is that, would that be outside? Like, I mean, it's 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 all cartography, but like, you're talking about like, like, a, like a city or a region, sort of world maps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, stuff like that, like a, con- like, 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 yeah, like world maps. Do you, do you do any of those? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In, in fact, I have several that have been published in different books, but, uh, 
they take a lot more time to to create uh as ironically especially cities because cities are um what's the word i'm looking for asinine in detail because of yeah. the you know, little buildings and the yeah it has to make sense why was it structured this way and you know it's it's just uh to do a really good i, I did two recently for dark, dark naga games and i think both of those city maps they're pretty good size but uh uh full full spread so there were two pages each uh i think i ended up spending like 25 to 30 hours on each of them Oof. as opposed to like three to five for a dungeon wow that hmm. is something and um so so when you're doing those do do you use um cuz i i haven't done a, i haven't done one of these in a long time i did i did one world map uh in pretty pretty big detail but what i did was i took uh one of these big printouts of the earth like from nasa um uh the super high resolution and I basically did like clone stamping. So I would take like a section and paint it in and take another section and paint it in and then blend them together. And I basically created my own map. And if you knew what you were looking for, you could you could say, that kind of looks like part of India right there. And that looks because it was, you know, I would I would clone in a whole a chunk of it. Now, I did my best to make it my own thing, you know, but it is what it is. But. Um, one of the things I had considered doing was developing a bunch of brushes for like mountains and trees and like, and then that way I could just stamp them down where I needed them. Is, is that how you do it? Uh, I usually make, yeah, I'll, I'll make the equivalent of stamps. I'll just make objects that I'll pull into my, you know, as multiple layers into my uh, map document. Uh, I'll do brushes, but my, I usually use brushes for like detailing and, and finishing rather than actually creating the, the objects. Uh, but yeah, I'll have like, yeah, you know, a, a PSD that has, this is a bunch, bunch of trees, one, two, three, four through 10. And then I can go grab a bunch, 10 of trees and I can clone it and rotate it around and make it, you know, look different on the map. Mm -hmm. All right. That's cool. Neato. Well, um, and then go ahead, Mike. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was like, that was oh. actually me. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to bring up if, if you're yeah. wanting, wanting to, uh, create a world maps, uh, you know, for like your own, for your home games, there's an awesome new tool. Uh, I don't know if you've seen Inc Incart Name. Hmm. Uh, I think I've heard of it. Yeah, it's it's it creates oh, mind-bogglingly yes. awesome maps. Yeah, yeah. You know, for you know, for for home play, but uh, it's I mean, it's basically like a cartographer generator. You know, I mean, you're they're all going to be cookie cutter. They're all going to look the same, but what it looks like looks amazing. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I, you know, and there's, we were at, oh, crap. So I was at GaryCon this, this last, this last go, and we talked to someone who was one of the map companies, one of the, the um, big, like, computer map companies that had kind of, well, they had their product out back in the 90s, and then they kind of, I, like, I guess maybe even early 2000s, and they kind of petered out. Like, they didn't keep up with the software and, you know, and other softwares kind of passed. And then they came back, and they've been doing a big relaunch. And I'm trying to think of the name. It, was one, it wasn't Dun Genie. Fantasy, it? Was it? It's not Pro Fantasy, is it? They've been pretty steady all the way through. Uh, you know, I can't remember. But they they had a license. So they, they had it so that if you paid for a certain license, you could actually then make your own maps and sell them if you wanted to based off of their stuff. Nice. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because there are a lot of people who like, you know, I mean, this is, this is the age of us doing our own thing and selling our own stuff and, you know, not just creating stuff for your gamers. I mean, you're going to make this really super nice map, right? It's There's nothing wrong with wanting to share that map with other people. It's like if it's just for your home game and, you, you know, you jot down some notes, you do a drawing one afternoon, that's great. But if you're going to spend, you know, 20 hours making this map for your players, you know, Maybe you want to share it with the world if it's really cool because there might be a lot of other people that want to use it. People are their own worst critic, though. That's true. That's no. true. I, I can be. I can be. And y you're the second worst critic. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, mean, I, I firmly support anything that's going to foster creativity, anything that will get people to do things hands-on. I mean, it may be counterintuitive to my market. You know, I'm selling maps, you know, so not making maps makes me money, but you know, anytime that, that you can provide people with the ability to create something themselves, I'm all for it, 100. percent Yeah, nice, nice. All right, so you know what? Let's let's talk about Mike. What else is on our list of things to well, talk about? Well, I, I wanted to segue into first, just asking uh, Justin. Justin, that is your name, yeah, right? Not it Jason, is, right? Okay, <laughs> maybe. I think it's my name. All right, all right. Just don't ask me. Okay. 
<laughs> so no, Justin, uh, what do you what do you what are you playing when you're not uh, making maps? Uh, what do you what are you doing? You get you uh, you have a group, a gaming group, and what do yeah. you, if you do, what are you guys playing? Yeah, we're right now. I'm actually still running a Pathfinder campaign, uh, but we we play either Pathfinder or Five E um, the majority of the time. Sometimes I'll break something out. Sometimes I go old school with some some basic, but uh, I think probably it's been about two months since we gamed, unfortunately. And, and if any of them are listening, guys, we, we need to game again. Uh, call me. <laughs> but uh, we usually we usually try to game about once every other week, about twice a month. So, and it's all homebrew stuff. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, like, uh, still just in the the fantasy realm, or more in the modern, or yeah. No, I go full fantasy when I'm running a game. Uh, okay. Yeah, I say that, but I've literally got like every Starfinder product that that, that they have released. Period. I really want to run a Starfinder campaign. In the real world, you know, it's easy to find one online for virtual tabletop, but I can't find the the, the group that's is, interested in playing. So maybe sometime I'll find enough players locally to run an actual uh, full on sci fi campaign. So all right, if Five E and all the D and Ds at Pathfinder, if it all falls off the uh, face of the earth, never exists, what what do you play next? I make D and D play it. Now, what if what D and D doesn't exist? I don't for whatever you can't get it. Can't it, it's just gone. <laughs> What's next? There's a geese uh, against you that you can't play. It. Yes, <laughs> right. Oh. Someone's casted no D and D for you. <laughs> wow, uh, uh, D and D Nazi. <laughs> I don't know. You couldn't really find anything. To, I mean, to to, to be re- relative, you know. I mean, I play games. I play whole retro RPGs, you know, and I have since I was a kid, and I still enjoy them and love them. Uh, I also play Magic: The Gathering, but none of those are. It's kind of. I also play board games. So I guess it would just be any of those would fill the the, the void. Oh, massive. Well, I, I'm talking about just a uh, you can't you you you're you're not you're you can't play any D and D or five E fantasy games. What's next on your list oh, of so uh, other RPGs? RPGs. Yeah, things. yeah. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I was like, I don't know. I can't imagine a world without RPGs. Oh no no no! <laughs> just, just imagine a world without D and D. Please, this is not a horror movie. Yeah, <laughs> please. I, I apologize. I, I so humbly apologize. <laughs> Halloween is over, Mike. Jesus. Ark. Um, <laughs> uh, I guess that would give me the opportunity to fall back on Starfinder. Uh, there you go. I mean, yeah, that would be it. Uh, okay. I mean, if we're just getting rid of fantasy, I would just go straight to sci-fi. Nice. All right. Okay. Pete, Pete, what's your group playing now? We. Oh God. All right. So right now, <laughs> this is my favorite. <laughs> yeah. No. Right Pete's now. bastardization. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So our group always. I mean, we always kit bash like crazy. Uh, current. Our current campaign is is a game called core so it's by a company called btrc which is a company that very few people have heard of um until you say something like guns 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 which is a a book they published years ago that seems everybody seems to know but uh it's a really uh gritty hardcore like kind of modern uh modern setting type of game uh, but we set that in the just as cyberpunk is hitting. So it's not full on cyberpunk yet. Cybernetics are just starting to come out. Hover like the AVs are just starting to come out. Corporations are just starting to take over. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, while we were playing, they the the hum or the not the Humvee, the AV was just announced. So when our characters started playing, there were no AVs available, but now there are making an appearance. So we're supposed to be like right on the cusp. Uh, however, <laughs> however, we did the hey, uh, Mike. We we yeah. jumped we jumped the portal. So of you we're did. we're yeah. So they have they have launched Fringeworthy into it, which is another game that we play <laughs> we played all our lives. Uh, which is another game that most people have never heard of by TriTech Games, where we you can travel to interdimensional worlds and stuff. So of course we found of course we found a portal and. There we are, but that's fun. We love doing that, so I'm not. Oh, gonna, yeah. I'm not. I, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying that it's that it's like, hey, here we are. But so what is this? It, is, what's two that? months, th- three months, two or three months? That's that's an all time record, man. You hit no, the uh, uh, fringe uh, no, in two, two months, no, huh? No, we we went all, we went like a full straight up nine months before we hit uh, alternate dimensions and stuff. Uh, we, okay, oh, that's good. good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, we're um, and we're just basically we're winding this one up because uh, as soon as the next Star Trek book comes out, so the new Star Trek adventures that came out in the last year or two, um, that we're waiting for the last, well, not the last, but what, I, it's probably not the last book, but the next book to come out, which is I think it's the science book. 
uh, once that comes out, we're going to be playing Star Trek Adventures, and we're going to go on a long campaign on that. So uh, cool. we're waiting for that. We've heard the 2D20 system is really awesome, so I can't, can't wait to give it a go. That's awesome. And you're talking about kit bashing. Uh, I've actually, what I've got planned when I do get that chance to run that Starfinder campaign is mm-hmm. actually to completely introduce uh, the Starfinder setting you know, with all its fantasy elements into the uh, Firefly setting nice. and merge those two. Nice. So, I thought, you so you have a, a, a space fantasy western. Nice. Oh, I like there it. I like work. it. There you go. See, I, I'm a, I'm not the biggest fantasy world genre lover. I love the modern, or I'll even do Seventh C. You know what I mean? But uh, I prefer I prefer to sail into a modern port. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mike, Mike is his favorite genre is cyberpunk. That's that's yeah, his well, go-to. Yeah. yeah. So, everyone's got a kink. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. Uh, so. So, Mike, I want to let's let's do the, the th- number three. Let's do number three on there. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. So the dreaded number three. Uh, yeah, I yeah hit you're finally gonna just, Justin. No, you would put down that you were into retro gaming, '80s and '90s console gaming. So that's a big thing for you. Uh, you know. Pete and I are old guys too. So, uh, what? Uh, tell us what's your what? What are you what, what are you dabbling in? And hopefully, you won't mention everything that I've put into the game that I've designed spe- specially for you. But uh, that we're going to be playing in a few minutes. But uh, what, what are you what, what are you dabbling in? You know, right now, what am I playing? Old school? Sure. Um, replaying Final Fantasy II on Super Nintendo, uh, which is uh, and then uh, Dragon Quest, the original uh, on NES. Those are the two things that I'm doing a replay through. I play them every couple of years. What is it? The Dragon Quest? Dragon, Dragon Warrior. Dragon Quest. Dragon Shaper. Warrior. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, you know, I. it's funny. I never owned any of my own consoles until, oh, Christ, I was 25 before I owned my own, like, home console. I played everybody else's, right? I, I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't, you know, oh, we didn't yeah. have a ton of money. But I would play on everybody. So I've played a you know, obviously Atari 2600, right? But I played on ColecoVision and television, um, NESs, of course. Um, oh, what was that? Oh, what was the Texas Instruments one? Um, the TI-99, do you remember that? They had the oh. cartridge that went in like this, and it was like a keep. yeah. So I played on those. Uh, Commodore 64s. But I got to say, you know, I, th- I think some of my favorite games from that time were the Commodore 64 games. Um, I There was this game, one of the games I... Oh my god! It was called Impossible Mission. I love that game. You ever? You guys ever play that? I, I, no. I have not played it. I've seen it played though. It's it's basically it's it's a it's so it's a, it's a single screen. You go down, you do the board, and you move on to the next screen. Um, but it's you don't shoot robots and stuff like that. There are um, the reason why I say robots. There are robots in it. Um, but you're going through this this subterranean base, and it's a it's about figuring out clues so it's 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 a game where you you jump over things you turn things on and off and you have to trigger things in certain orders so like you could trigger this one thing which would make the robots not be able to go left and then you go down the left side and then you go do a thing there and you trigger this other thing now they can go left but they can't go right so then you have to run and jump over them and once you jump over them you're fine because now you're on the right side so just stuff like that and it's this whole maze and you're collecting these pieces of a puzzle and then you'd put the puzzle together on the screen to try and figure it out, and you'd get clues for things. And like sometimes the clues would be how you would shut off the robots in the next room so you could get that piece of the puzzle. It was it was a really really cool game, and you hmm. it was one of the first games ever played where you could die as much as you wanted. It's just that every time you died, it added to your time, and you could run out of time. So that I I love that game, and I loved there was a Bruce Lee game for for Commodore sixty four that was awesome as well. Hmm. Um, Very cool. Yeah. So, Mike, one of my, what was yours? One of my favorite games ever. Uh, well, there's two. I would have to say uh, Pitfall and Yara's yes. Revenge. Yes. Oh, I loved Yara's <laughs> Revenge. Yeah. So, uh, definitely both of those. And um, what else? I don't know. Um, I remember my dad um, giving me an Atari 400 when he got his Atari 800, uh, which is, it was a little, it was the first, like there was the Ataris who had console, but it was actually had a keyboard on it. And he actually gave me, he got a disc drive. So he gave me the cassette 
and a bunch of games that ha were on cassette. So what you'd have to do in um, kids is you'd actually put the cassette in and you have to run basic language and say run and then the command to run this game in the cassette for a special command and push play and then the thing would like load in series of eight bits with sound running into the computer, load it into the buffer memory and it would load that game up. And even if the game itself was like 64 or uh, K or something like that, um, it, it loaded that game in. So I used to play games um, like that. I used to play uh, Star Raiders. Um, what else? God, there was just a couple of different. And when Mike games. says cassette, he means like cassette, like yeah. like like the mix cassette that you would put in your. Not yeah. well. I don't know how old any of like you are. TDK. Like, <laughs> like like yeah, like like a cassette, like a music cassette, like you would buy in yeah. the store, like you would buy your Def Leppard album on. Yeah. You know, you would you would hear. <laughs> and literally, it was throwing. You know, bits eight eight at a time into the computer, loading them in. So it would take which like was, ten minutes for this game to load, which was Does one it, step up from Mike loading his cards into the. Re <laughs> it really was one step above that. Do, uh, do either of you remember the shows where you, they would play at the end of the night and it would play the tones, and you were supposed to record it, and you would take that cassette and put it in. You could play the game or the program that they were promoting at the end of the what? program. I no! I, I yes. heard this. Yes. Which, which show was it? I can't remember. It was like, it was one of those, like, you know, at the time it was cutting edge tech bit yeah. TV, something or another. Yeah. But uh, you, they would actually just play the tones and you were supposed to get your recorder out and record it over the air and then take it to your computer and load it. I heard about that. Oh, I had God. never done it though. Yep. Yep. Wow. Wow. And see, I thought, so I had, I actually did the one, I, I forgot I, the one concert console game that I had, I bought at a yard sale for like, I don't know, maybe two bucks. Uh, it was a Pong game. So this was like 1987. And I bought like a Pong game from like 1975 or something. And it basically, it had Pong. That was it. And it had the, like the, the you turn the wheel. That was it. That's the only control you had. And that moved the paddle up and down. And that was the game. And it, it hooked in with the two wires on the back that you hooked onto the, the, the screws, the little UHF screws. So. So mm. that's and then but so the first console game that i had and i love this was the I, did you any of you guys ever have the original playstation like it was just mm -hmm. called playstation i had the aliens game for that and that was a friggin fantastic game it was so good hmm. i remember okay. playing it i remember playing it and i'm fighting aliens and there's this one part Alien jumps out, and I'm like, fell back in my seat, fell over, and I'm like, oh crap! I'm trying to get up to keep from getting. I'm like, ah, oh, I got killed! Damn it! Right? Because those <laughs> graphics were so real back then. Yeah, they were oh, just. Oh man, <laughs> don't don't knock the graphics. Yeah, <laughs> but we were talking. I was talking. I was playing, doing a playthrough of Dragon Quest. Uh, that you know, game in itself, a uh, Dragon Quest slash Dragon Warrior. Uh, that game in and itself has had an impact like n almost nothing else in my life because that game is what led me to playing D and D. That game is what led me to a desire to have a career in computer programming. The two biggest facets of my adult life both originated with Dragon Quest, nice. <laughs> which is either awesome or very, very, very sad. One of the two. <laughs> hey, a hey, quick, uh, a quick one for you guys. So, did you? Uh, so, got uh, Cuba Death that I'm doing, and it's you know it's all these geek trivia questions. One of them came. Up, what? was the very first easter egg in a video game in a con like i think i i don't remember if it was specified as console i guess it has to be console because i don't think they had them in arcade games yet uh before this one came out so it's probably the first ever so what was the very first easter egg do you guys know oh, i mean you don't have to tell, tell me what it was what just it tell was. me what game it was in what game was it in well, i can't tell you what game it was in but i can tell you what it was okay what the the de developer put his name in the game Yep, yep, that's correct. And I cannot remember the name of the game. It's the, the, you're walking around in the the, the castle one for yes. for Atari. Yeah, that's yeah, Ready that's Player right. One that was in that. Yeah, it was Advent Adventure was the game. That was the very oh, first wow. Easter egg that anyone ever put in a game. Because no one had ever thought of it. Not that anyone couldn't have. They just that that was. Mm -hmm. just, I, and I think he was disgruntled. I think he was disgruntled because he didn't get his. He didn't wasn't going to get his name and credits on something, and he so he put it in there so people could find it. Or yeah. something to that effect. Why not? I, I think it might have a little to do with the ego too, because I've mm -hmm. I, I've actually got like in a lot of the books that have been published, 
that I've been uh, contributed to. If you flip through the pages, you'll see me sitting in some of them as, as art, as like a character marked up as mocked up as different characters. So it's a, <laughs> there's, there's, there's that I'm leaving my personal touch mark feeling on, 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 on products. I think I can relate to that. And, and you know, why shouldn't you, you know, like rock stars, they get to do it. Cause they're, they're on the, they're, they're on the cover. Everybody sees their pictures and stuff. Why should well, they're lucky. They we get to be the product. Creating our stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's, yeah. Of hard work. Hey, speaking of games. Uh, oh, no. Yeah. You ready to play a game, Mike? <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. A little bit of I'm forewarning. Uh, yes. I once got kicked off a trivia team because I'm so bad. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's fine. It's all no, good. No, the kind of games I make, you don't have to know it. You don't have to know it. Right. There's, there's, I can be there's guessing also, we're good, right? Yeah. Justin, Justin, most of our games are just friggin' guessing anyway. It's, it's mostly yeah, awesome. just a fucking, it's mostly just a fucking guess. It's like, ah, uh, sure. So I, 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 I would refrain from using Google and just get it wrong. So let's roll. Yeah, that's, yeah. I'm good with that. You don't win anything. Well, you, there is one thing you win. There's one thing you win. Really, right. it's not. Uh, it's, don't tell. Don't, 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 don't. Okay. Uh, All right, Mike. Here yes. you go. Here you go. All right, and it is game time with the Mythwits. I am your game master, Mike Kafis, and today we are going to play Player One or Player None. And from mostly the 80s and 90s, except for one. I will give you, gentlemen, the name of nine video game characters. And you must, and I will also actually read you the description of the game and or character, and you must tell me whether that character is or is not actually a part of that game's franchise. All right. So every game is real. I haven't, I haven't fabricated any game I was going to, and then uh, there were so many games that I'd never seen before. I was like, oh, wow, this is great. So, uh... With that said, let's get going. All right. Uh, the scores. Are I, you know what? I am going to let Justin decide. Justin, would you like to go first or second? I'll go first. All right. Excellent. So, Justin, the first character's name is Minor Willie from the game uh, Manic Minor. Circa 1983, an unlikely hero who introduced a generation to the joys of video gaming. Minor Willie is one of the most important contributions to pop culture in the last 50 years and will be remembered forever as the first purely digital superstar to ignite the imagination of kids across the UK. I'm 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 going to, I'm going to explain why I'm going to give my answer. Uh, I grew up in Arizona, uh, out n near some theme park, abandoned ghost mine kind of things, mm -hmm. uh, and the name Willie always popped up with miners. So I'm going to say that's actually the character's name. <laughs> that's not the only thing that popped up with miners. Oh, Easy. anyway, um, Easy. Hey. So, <laughs> yes, in fact, you are correct, sir. Miner Willie is a character in Manic Miner. All those trips to the abandoned mine theme park paid off. Very good. All right. And Peter, I don't know if this yeah. is good or bad for you, but your next one is the character's name, or is not, <laughs> Shell, from the game Portal, circa 2007. The only one I had to go outside of the uh, 80s and 90s because it's one of my favorite games. So Shell is the silent protagonist in the Portal video game series developed by Valve Corporation. She appears in both Portal and Portal 2 as the main player character. Shell. Hmm. You've played Portal, haven't you? I, yes, I, I have played it. I did not finish it. I did not, like, I did not go through... I did not I spend did not. a lot of time on it. Yeah, I, I have played it, but I have not, like... Yeah. Like, really jones on it. So, Shell. Um, so, I'm not familiar with the storyline. Like, I think I started, like, four levels in on, like, you were showing me. I think I played at your house for a while. Mm -hmm. So, Shell. 
Shelly. See, that could be short for Shelly. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to say yes. That that is that is the main character's name. If you said that Shell is the main character's name in Portal, you would be correct Mungo. Very good. All right. All right, Justin, on to you. The name of this character is Chef Smoky Salt from the game Burger Time circa 1982. Nice. Smoky Salt. I remember the game. As an arcade game created by Data East, initially for the Daco cassette system, another cassette system, the player is... Smoke is Chef Smoky Salt, who must walk over hamburger ingredients located across a maze of platforms while avoiding pursuing characters. I remember the game really well, and I don't remember that name, so I'm gonna say no. I might be wrong, but I don't remember that, so well, if you don't remember that name, is there a name you do remember? I do not, but I do not remember. I would have I think I would have remembered that. Okay. So. Well, if you said the Chef Smoky Salt from Burger Time was incorrect. You would be? Yes, correct. Now, the reason I had to go with this one, and the reason I had to change the name is, no one would ever have believed it was Chef Peter Pepper. Peter Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> I had to give you a chance. <laughs> Peter Pepper. <laughs> right? Peter Pepper was the chef's name. How about that? Okay. Uh, Peter, Peter, this is a, this is a good one. This is a good one. Your character's name is Pauline. Pauline, okay. Now, from circa 1981, a little game that you may or may not have heard of, you may or may not have played, called Donkey Kong. Now, I've played Donkey Kong. Pauline was a damsel, was the damsel in distress that Mario... Originally, did you know Mario's original name? Mr. Video. And then later named Jumpman. Jumpman, okay. Mario was trying to rescue Pauline after being captured by the infamous Donkey Kong. Pauline. Um, I don't think that's her name. Fuck, it could be. I mean, I, I I don't know what her name is, but I, oh God, I don't think it's Pauline. So I'm going to say no. Peter, if you said that Pauline was not the damsel in distress in Donkey Kong, you would be wrong. That's so Pauline cool. was her name. Pauline was her name. Who the hell knew that, right? Well, I think Justin knew. Uh, oh, yeah, knew. Justin. No, that, right. that's a no, no, that's a noble thing. I just didn't know it. That, that, right. that is not something where I would be like, who the f*** could know that, Mike? No, that's, yeah. that was totally noble. <laughs> no, I, hey, I didn't know until I, I looked it up, so there you go. <laughs> Spence, uh, said, Spence said Chef Smoky Salt grew up to be Salt Bay. <laughs> <laughs> salt Bay, there's a good one. All right. Nice. All right. Uh, let's go, Justin. Here's your next one. If I were to just read this name to you without, without the franchise, possibly, would you recognize Dr. Gerald Fisher? Mm, maybe. No, I wouldn't. Now, if I were then to say Dr. Gerald Fisher was from a little franchise video game called Half-Life, and that... Half-Life was a first-person shooter video game developed by the Valve Corporation for Microsoft. Players assume the role of Dr. Gerald Fisher, who must fight his way out of the Black Mesa Research Facility after an experiment goes horribly wrong. I honestly don't know. So I'm going to stick with what's been right so far and say yes, it is. Sticking with what is right so far... Would have been good if it were right. However, it is unfortunately wrong. Dr. Jail Fisher is not his name. When I give you this name, then you're going to be like, God damn it, Michael. Dr. Gordon Freeman. 
Oh, of course, I, of no. course, it was Doctor Gordon where, Freeman. Where did you get the name Doctor Fisher? I totally made it up. <laughs> oh. well, see, I'm sitting here. I'm thinking I, I know that name from somewhere, and it's completely fabricated. Well, I mean, I just was like Gordon Freeman, Gerald Fisher. It's G F. That's what I went for. Nice. So, yep, there you go. All right, Peter. Did you know? Did you know Doctor Fisher? Pete. Yes. He. Oh. He's, he's my podiatrist. Okay. Good. Well, speaking of podiatrists, that have you been? Did you did you uh, hack my doc? No, I did not. Okay, you hack my doc, bro. <laughs> <laughs> did you hack my doctor, Fisher? <laughs> your 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 next character is, or characters, I should say, are Toe Jam and Earl. Toe Jam. Circa, right. circa nineteen ninety one, an action game developed by Johnson. Vorsanger Productions and published by Sega for the Sega Genesis console. It centers on Toe Jam and Earl, two alien rappers who have crash landed on Earth. The Enterprise. Is it Rappa de, Rappa Parappa? What, what is this? Toe Jam and Earl. So are what, Toe Jam and Earl. What's what, the game? What, what, the, the game is Toe Jam and Earl. Okay, all right. So the game is Toe Jam and Earl, and the characters yes. are Toe Jam and Earl. Well, the, the, of of the you know kind of like a Journey from the band Journey. I got you. Okay, I got you. I'm, I'm trying. You just you didn't make that clear. Journey's you album. Make that clear. Yeah. I got you. Did not Boston. make that clear. So I'm making it out. clear. I'm clearing it up since you did not speak well. Led um, Zeppelin. Let's say I'm gonna say okay. yeah. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say their Toe Jam and Earl is right. Well, no, I'm gonna take offense to that. You think that I couldn't come up with something as ingenious to throw you off your scent? <laughs> Pun intended. As Toe Jam and Earl? No, I like the scent of Toe Jam. You do. And you, <laughs> you smell it well, my friend, because Toe Jam and Earl, correct. Nice. Very. I had no, I, I had no idea. I was just guessing. All right. Now, this next, this next character is from... As uh, I previously mentioned, one of my favorite games, and I could not believe uh, finding this information out. Or not finding it out, as it were. That the name of this character is Captain Zirkel Ezix from the 1982 game Yars <laughs> Revenge. Wow. The player oh. controls Captain Zirkel Ezix of the planet Yar, who must nibble or shoot through a barrier in order to fire his Zerlon cannon into the breach. The object of the game is to destroy the evil Kotile, while it, which e exists on the other side of the barrier. Now, Justin. Uh, Isix, absolutely of Yar. All, all of that sounds completely fabricated and made up. So I'm going to say that, yes, it's real. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah, it didn't even sound like you were speaking English. It was like you know, the, you know yeah, we'll just go with yes, yes. I, I, I'm gonna, un unlike Peter, who is always just demeaning me and making me feel worthless. You, my friend, have just you've you've made me feel special. You, you've said that I made up something that sounds so so realistic that it could be in a video game, because Captain Zirkol Isaac. Is in fact completely fabricated. Fabricated. <laughs> nice. So I, I would like to point out that uh, there is no real name in this case. Uh, the Yar, uh, who are a real people, the Yar, are actually mutagenic houseflies uh, shot into space by humans. Now, how did I find this out? Well, I read the comic released by Atari. That's right, nice. my friends. They released a comic. <laughs> And I was like, oh, I'm gonna, I read the whole little comic. It's more so a comic with the instructions how to play the game, but it was in a comic yeah. form. And I'm like, nice. oh, I'm going to get a name out of this. No one's going to get this name. There was not one name. I'm like, crap, now i got to make up a name. <laughs> yes. Nice. All right. So, all right. What's all right. Next? Okay. It was Excellent. How many more of these we got, Mike? Uh, one, two. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Peter. Yes, sir. Your name is Maurice... Murray. Okay. From the famed, famous, infamous game Tapper, circa 1983. 
Maurice oh Lemaire. God. The Tapper game screen features four bars. Patrons arrive periodically at the end of the bar opposite the bartender, Maurice Lemaire. And they demand drinks. He must draw, serve drinks at, to the patrons as they slowly advance toward the player. If any customers reach Maurice at the end of the bar, they impatiently grab him and toss him out on the end of the bar, causing the player a lost life. Man, dude, I this is all right. So I know I want to play that game. Yeah, I love Tapper. Tapper was a fun game. I spent right? I spent a lot of time playing that on console on somebody else's console. Uh, <laughs> of course you did. Right, you mooch. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I. God, I want to say that his name can't be Maurice because what Western character is named Maurice? But most of these games are made by Japanese companies, right? So what the hell do they know about what our Western towns are like? And to be honest with you, there's nothing, there, there's no reason why a Western bartender couldn't have been named Maurice. Um, it's just, hey. you know, I just, I just picture Maurice. What kind of name is Maurice? But uh, Peter, um, can, can I can I give you a hint just so you're not wrong for the wrong reasons? Okay. Okay. The the bars, there were four different bar scenarios. One was country, the other one was modern, the other one was like um, so so I just I I, I want to point I that out. All, I thought it was all saloon. Am I thinking of a different game? Well, this one was sponsored by Budweiser. <laughs> it's actually oh. And, and and remember Root Beer Tapper? Root Beer? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, that was the same game. They had to dumb it down for kids because they uh, re realized see, it was right, so popular. Right, kids wanted right. to play it. You could yeah. only go into drinking bars, but this was Budweiser's attempt at selling beer originally. Right. It would be it would be like having a, having a video game for kids called Smoker where you have to right. smoke as many yeah. cigarettes as you can. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Fair enough. Um, Joe Camel. Yeah, all right, enough, enough joking around. So I'm going to say uh, – I'm, I'm just going to use my gut – Oh, my gut says that, that it's real. Right, my gut says Maurice is real, so I'm going to go with my gut. Real. All right. Maurice Lemaire is actually a real person, but he happens to be the person who voiced Tapper in Wreck-It Ralph. That is the voice actor's name. Oh, man. The, the character, Tapper, as it were, is nameless. Man, you know what that means? That is correct. <laughs> so uh, I just thought of that really interesting there. I, I, I said, you know what? I, I thought it was like pretty obvious. It was like, who the hell would go with Maurice LaBear? But I was like, oh, no, no, that, I'm, go I'm uh, going with the name. Paul I'm just amazingly, you... amazingly uh, intrigued that a beer company uh, sponsored a video game. Ah, it's yeah. kind of cool. I mean, there why not? You, you know what's funny is, uh, um, so I'm not watching that chat room while we play because I don't want to cheat, but I looked over to the chat room and I've got – uh, Paul Noons is like, you're thinking Wreck-It Ralph. Spence is like, Wreck-It Ralph is so good. They, they were on it. They were on it, Mike. <laughs> there you go. I know my peeps. All right, come on. Okay. Let's let's get through this. Okay. We're coming up with the last, last one. Last one. Okay. Uh, uh, Pete, what's the score? Uh, the score is two to two. Justin, you're up. All right. Okay, Justin, for the win. Here we go. This is a, a two characters from a, a video game franchise called Bub and Bob from the franchise Bubble Bobble. Circa 1986, a comical action platformer starring the twin bubble dragons, Bub and Bob, who were tasked with traveling through 100 stages, blowing and wow. bursting bubbles, jumping on and off blown bubbles to navigate level obstacles, dodging and eliminating enemies and collecting a variety of items including power-ups there's a michael uh, jackson joke in there dude <laughs> <laughs> bub and bob uh, i'm gonna go with no bub and bob of bubble bobble you're going with no and that is incorrect sir i'm sorry oh uh. However, I have good news and I have great news. Yeah. The good news is that the the guest always the tie always goes to the guest, and the great news is you are the guest. Yes, <laughs> there's a third I, one in there. I've kept my losing streak going, so I'm. I'm... No, 
thought no, you at you, least did a tie. Oh, 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 oh. oh. And ties go to our guests. So, Justin, here's your prize. You ready for it? Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes. There you go. Pride. Pride. That is it. And I would like to encourage everyone to please check out Justin's uh, websites, Path, pathstoadventure.com and www.bigbookofmaps.com. And uh, Big Book of Maps 2 just kickstarted or just finished kickstarting a few months ago, and you're working on it, and that should be out soon too. So go go uh, join. You have a mailing list on your site uh, as well. So get on the mailing list. Find out when these maps are coming out because uh, – and, and you have a lot of stuff on RPG now or RPG drive through So if you want to just check out some stuff, check that out as well. Yeah, if you go to pathstoadventure.com, you'll find all my stuff linked right there. All right. And and I, I was looking around at your blog, and I have a little bit of – little inter some interesting stuff here and there. So uh, you're a you're – a, interesting dude <laughs> appreciate it yes yeah so and I'll, and i'll tell you i i will personally endorse this i have the the first big book of maps product it is fantastic it is it really awesome i i love it it's it's good stuff i love maps I, i'm a map map file and uh and, and it, justin does a great job thanks man yeah man so mike you ready roll that beautiful bean footage here you go, buddy. You've just enjoyed another awesome episode of The Mythwits. We are live on Facebook Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Please ask us or our guests questions or just banter with our other Mythfits. If you, if you miss our show, you can always catch the Encore episodes on Facebook or on YouTube. Find us on Facebook and Twitter as Mythwits and check out Mythwits.com. If you don't have time for videos, make sure you subscribe to our podcast via your favorite pod catcher. You gotta catch them all. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it is appropriate and make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread the Mythwits love over the entire planet. We'll just take, just spread it, just sprinkle it over a little bit. Just one little speck, put it somewhere. Please, sprinkle it. Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out P, uh, tsrpn.com for more cool shows. Mythwits is a Creative Commons product. Like, share in all the appropriate places, and just don't edit it. And don't share it, and don't put it on a map and call it your own. Make oh, sure you? to check out etherforge.com for more cool stuff, and join our mailing list. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next time, Pete! I felt like a kid standing in the world's greatest video arcade without any quarters, unable to do anything but walk around and watch the other kids play. Ernest Klein, Ready Player One. Till next time.